Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. The elusive search for justice. Should individuals, including government officials, be legally held to account for starting aggressive wars, like in Iraq? Is it fair and moral that Bush-era officials be given immunity from prosecution? If they're not held accountable, then who is ultimately responsible? To Crosstalk Crimes and Punishment, I'm joined by Indra Komar in San Francisco. He is the chief counsel on the case seeking to apply the crime of aggression against members of the Bush administration. And in New York, we cross to Ed Krajewski. He is an associate editor at Reason 24-7. All right, gentlemen, Crosstalk rules, in effect, that means you can jump in any time you want, and I very much encourage it. Indra, if I can go to you first in San Francisco, you're representing the plaintiff in this case. Could you tell us a little bit about the plaintiff and what is the case? Absolutely. Thank you, Peter, and it's a pleasure to be on. Uh, my client is an Iraqi woman, an Iraqi single mother, who fled from Iraq, uh, you know, in the aftermath of the war in 2005. She's a refugee now in Jordan, where she's supporting her dependents, essentially, um, you know, by herself. And what she's alleging in her complaint against six defendants, six Bush administration officials, including George W. Bush, uh, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, Condoleezza Rice, Colin Powell, and Paul Wolfowitz, is that these six defendants uh, planned and waged a war uh, in violation of, of the Nuremberg principle against aggression. So she's alleging that the war was uh, planned starting in 1998 at a small nonprofit called the Project for the New American Century, uh, which Donald Rumsfeld Dick Cheney and Paul Wolfowitz were mem members of, and that after they planned the war, they these people used 9-11 as a cover, as an excuse to scare and mislead the American public and the international community uh, to support a war. And then she alleges that the war, finally, when it happened, did not have proper legal authorization under various treaties, including the UN Charter, the kellogg briand Pact, and the Nuremberg Charters. Uh, so that's the, the heart of the case. And it, we, you know, the case was filed in March, and as you mentioned in August, the Department of Justice filed uh, this Westfall Act certification, yep. which is a request to the court that these six defendants be essentially immunized uh, from, from civil proceedings. Okay, Ed, I mean, I think everything that Ender just said, most critical people would agree with, but is there a case? Because we do have um, federal statutes that can just give immunity to the, all of the individuals that uh, Ender just mentioned. Yes, they can. And that's, that's you know, that the federal statutes on the federal level, but the same thing also happens on the local level. You know, often when there's police brutality claims, when there's a settlement that ends up coming out, the settlement always say that nobody accepts any liability. So I think while the work Indoor is doing is important, uh, it's kind of, it's a long shot to have expected the Department of Justice not to immunize these officials because moving forward, you know, Barack Obama, when he's out of office, yeah. and Eric Holder and whoever else, yep. when they're out of office, they're not going to want to have to be held responsible for anything that might be in the future considered illegal that they're doing now. Well, Ed, you got and way, you, 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 to, you to got Libya way ahead Syria, of me. You got way ahead of me on this program because that's exactly what I wanted to ask. And I think that's Ender's work is actually very valuable because it doesn't, it's, um, Barack Obama is going to just, you know, basically pardon himself, okay, because this is essentially what's going on here. This is a culture of impunity here. Ender, it's been mentioned, it's a hard case. Um, what else do you want to achieve by it? Just awareness? Well, no, I, I think actually, I mean, people say it's a hard case, and, you know, you know I, I think what's hard about it, or I think what people, um, you know, what's, what's innovative or novel about the case is just applying these rules equally. You know, so, you know, let me give you a common law example. In the common law, uh, premeditated murder is the worst crime you can commit. Uh, self-defense is not a crime, right? If, if you kill somebody in, 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 in self-defense, uh, there's no crime that's been committed. And that's what, that's what the common law teaches us. And international law, it's the same thing. Um, you know, war committed in, in self-defense is, is not a crime. It's not actionable under the Nuremberg principles. And, you know, what's, what's interesting about this case is this is the first time since Nuremberg that the crime of aggression will be actually yes. used against anybody. Uh, so, you know, you know, Nuremberg gave us the crime of genocide, which, which we apply now, in international court supply, domestic court supply. It gave us the crime of crimes against humanity. Uh, but the chief crime, you know, what the tribunal called the supreme international crime, is this crime of aggression. And it's, it's interesting that for the last 60 years, it's basically lain silent and gathered dust. So, I mean, one of the chief goals of the lawsuit is actually to have a federal court 
examine international law, which it can do, and say that, in, consistent with Nuremberg, consistent with the recognition of genocide and crimes against humanity, aggression itself is, is also a crime. And if we get further, you know, if, if, if the court actually goes ahead and applies these rules, as I think it ought to, to these defendants, uh, I, I don't think it's that, you know, unrealistic or unimaginable that a court could find some liability here. And what do you think about that? Because the, the facts on the ground are, are extremely well known. We all know, or these critical minds know how we got into this war in Iraq illegally. And everything that the, the, the case that uh, we've been presented with on this program is factually true. But at the same time, no one is going to be held responsible for this catastrophe against the people of Iraq, against all of the soldiers that went there and died. And of course, the, the cost of it all and the blowback that we all continue to experience. Right. Well, now, Indor can correct me if I'm wrong, but if, if I remember my history, I think the crimes of aggression were the hardest ones to prosecute, even at Nuremberg, right? Even though what the Nazis did was obviously illegal. Even with the crime of aggression, the international community was kind of a little more hesitant about pushing that one. Because, you know, in theory, there's these things about aggression and Well, I think you're right. I think what happened in Nuremberg is, is that, you know, there was a debate. Oh, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. No, go ahead, Indor. Go ahead. Reply. Please do. No, no, go ahead. Uh, well, yeah. Yeah, I think, well, you know, at Nuremberg there was a debate, you know, on an honest debate amongst the, the four allied powers as to what crimes are we going to bring. And, you know, actually it was the Americans. It was, uh, it was the chief prosecutor, Robert Jackson, who was a you know, yeah. member of our Supreme Court, uh, you know, at the time, who really yeah. pushed for this crime. He really believed that the crime of aggression uh, was, was something that was important and ought to be prosecuted. And the tribunal agreed. The tribunal called it the chief, the supreme international crime. And what they found, you know, what was different about the crimes of that era was that there was the planning element. I mean, that's what they really focused on, was that it wasn't just, you know, the Nazis coming to power and saying, hey, well, look, uh, you know, now's our chance to be aggressive. It was before that. I mean, part of the reason they wanted to come to power was, was to implement this plan that they had for, for waging war. And so what my client alleges is similarly that there were people in the administration who had a pre-existing plan, yeah. uh, who, who really wanted to invade Iraq, uh, who were part of a movement uh, designed to, to basically flex American military might in the region. And uh, when they came to power, you know, they weren't able to do it immediately, but once there was this unrelated terrorist incident, they were able to use it as cover. So I think the planning is what makes this uh, more appropriate for a case for, to consider the crime of aggression. And, you know, aggression is gaining a lot more uh, acceptance in the international community. The ICC, the International Criminal Court in The Hague, will have jurisdiction of this crime in just a couple years. There was an amendment that was passed very recently related to aggression. Uh, so people know it's out there. People yeah. know that it, it, it's, a, it's a chief important crime. It just, you know, hasn't been implemented. People haven't, haven't, have wanted to stay away from it precisely because well, of the you know, accountability it, it, issues it, it, that we're It's right. About. I mean, Ed, I mean, you can go, you know, you can get some Serbs and put them on trial, and you can get some African leaders and put them on trial, but you don't find Americans being put on trial for war crimes. I mean, it's really because it's they're powerful. And I find it very interesting is that the Nuremberg statutes are being even mentioned here. American officials are being apply, looking at history and saying that the application of the Nuremberg principle should apply to Americans. It's a pretty sad state of affairs. Yeah, but I think it's also it's, it's important to remember that, that not only did Congress authorize the use of military force in Iraq uh, in 2002, that the uh, regime change in Iraq was, was the law of the land in the U.S. since 1997 or 1998 when Bill Clinton, a Democrat, signed the uh, Iraqi Liberation Act. So uh, while there's definitely, you know, the idea that That's true. there's a very That's misguided it. war that Bush really wanted to get into, it's also that this was actually, the Iraq war was a, a, a culmination of more than a decade of U.S. policy toward Iraq. Yes, and but, not just something yes, that but uh, even though, Bush and Dick Even if the U.S. Congress the passes these thing, uh, laws, you know, it doesn't make it right, okay? An act of aggression is an act of aggression. I don't no, care but it makes if it gets a rubber stamp from co Congress, just like with the Syria situation right now. I don't care what Congress has to say. A war of aggression is a war of aggression under international law. In your, in, again, you know, we have this case with Syria right now pending, and we still don't have this impunity. You know, they can still do what they want because they have no fear of prosecution later. Well, I think that's an important point, that this is all, this is very relevant in today's news yeah. with respect to Syria. And actually, actually I, I do want to take a, you know, I do think, you know, 
the Congress's input is important for purposes of domestic law. You know, I think we, there, are, there is case law out there from the, from the 50s, uh, you know, where Eisenhower tried to take over a steel mill. It's called Youngston, the Youngston Steel Mill case. Um, and, and the court, you know, they are analyzed that, you know, congressional input is actually a very important factor in determining whether the president's actions are right. Uh, you know, but I think the issue here is, you know, even assuming congressional input and acceptance of, of these policies, whether, you know, these people can still commit crimes that are of international Not importance. Just I mean, it can't be the case. Right. It can't be. Exactly. Well, authorization. But it, it can't be the case that the president can come to Congress. Well, let me, it can't be the case that the president can come to Congress and say, you know, I want to have, I want, I like to have slaves at the White House, <laughs> or I want to, you know, build genocide factories, and Congress somehow is convinced to do it, that that's okay or legal under international law. And I think the same is true for war making. It can't be the case that if Congress gets, you, you know, get gives an authorization based on flimsy or false pretenses, as we all know, or that 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 was the case with Iraq, and what my client alleges is the factual predicate. Uh, it can't be the case that the president is, is somehow okay. And, you know, there are three branches here. I mean, we have to look. I think this is an issue, too, for the courts to really look into, because the courts under our system decide what's legal. That goes back to Marbury v. Madison. The courts are, are the last say on what's the law. And if aggression is the law, I think so it's appropriate to, to, to for the on courts to questions. examine these cases. Okay, Ed, jump in before we go to the break. Well, right. Go and ahead. So that's what the Department look, of Justice Ed, is Ed, jump in. Here. Go ahead. No, I mean, I agree, and I think this is why the Department of Justice did what it did. I think this is why uh, U.S. government officials, Democrat and Republican, are wary of joining international regime, regimes mm. like the International Criminal Court. Because you're right, a lot of the things the U.S. does is illegal under international law. But it's not illegal under federal law, and that's why they want to make sure that that's just the only law that applies. And so they're going to make this argument that George Bush and Dick Cheney and future government officials won't be able to do their job. Okay, Ed, I have to jump in here. We have to go to a short break. And after that short break, we'll continue our discussion on war crimes and accountability. Stay with our team. Welcome back to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. To remind you, we are discussing war crimes and accountability. Okay, Andrew, I'd like to go back to you in San Francisco. I mean, essentially what this, what this uh, uh, lawsuit is all about is about accountability and justice. And we have Dick Cheney walking around giving speeches and, and you know, selling his books. But we have people like Manning in prison. We have Snowden on the lam. And uh, they didn't kill anybody. Uh, they <laughs> actually wanted to bring justice to others and be more open and bring transparency to government. But again, we see government doesn't, doesn't want any kind of accountability and doesn't want any kind of transparency. Well, I think that's right. And, I, you know, I think the point of the lawsuit in a lot of ways is that the law needs to apply equally. I don't think that's a controversial statement to make, but it's become controversial. And I think what we see in the Syria, um, you know, Syria instance in the latest news is that there's a, there's a certain sectors of our, of our government that are so willing to just reach for the trigger, yeah. essentially, to solve international problems. And that's not the world that we wanted after World War II. That's not the world our, our founders wanted. That's not, it's, it's not a world that, that, that is consistent with my, my sense of what America could and should be. Uh, and, and part of that is, is, is applying the rule of law and, and adhering to it. So, you know, we created this, uh, this pretty fascinating international system after World War II that required UN authorization for acts of violence, that where the UN said we were the most, or the US said we're the most powerful country, but we're going to use that power justly. And uh, I want to live in a world where that's possible. And I think, you, you know, the courts can apply the law uh, in such a way where, where this might be a possibility to, to do it through the courts. What do you think about that, Ed? Do you think the courts really want to get involved in this? Because we've seen over the last uh, probably 30 years, executive privilege just continue to expand and expand at the expense of Congress and at the expense of the courts. Yeah, I mean, I don't think I don't think the courts really are usually reticent about uh, considering political questions, and I think they do consider war making and foreign policy a political question. So uh, while the ideal is great that they should be more involved, because you're right, we have three branches of government and they have their role, I think in practice, unfortunately, they've kind of taken several steps back from uh, engaging in political questions and policy matters uh, uh, that matter. 
Andrew, are, are you hoping that there'll be other plaintiffs that will come and make a case as well? Because it seems to me, it seems to me when, when the, the Department of Justice gives immunity, you know, or, or considers giving immunity, it means I have this feeling that the people that they're get, getting uh, the immunity are guilty of something. I mean, why are you protecting them, giving them cover? <laughs> Automatically, let's not talk about it. They're, you know, you can't touch them, untouchable. This is very interesting. Yeah. Chief counsel on the case seeking to apply the crime of aggression against members of the Bush administration. And in New York, we cross to Ed Krajewski. He is an associate editor at Reason 24 7. All right, gentlemen, crosstalk rules in effect. That means you can jump in anytime you want, and I very much encourage it. And if I can go to you first in San Francisco, you're representing the. Five. She's a refugee now in Jordan, where she's supporting her dependents essentially. Um you know, by herself. And what she's alleging in her complaint against six defendants, six Bush administration officials, including George W. Bush, uh, Dick Cheney, Donald. Plaintiff in this case, could you tell us a little bit about the plaintiff and what is the case? Absolutely. Thank you, Peter. And it's a pleasure to be on. Uh, my client is an Iraqi woman, an Iraqi single mother who fled from Iraq, uh, you know, in the aftermath of the war in 2005. Hello and welcome to Crosstalk, where all things are considered. I'm Peter Lavelle. The elusive search for justice should individuals, including government officials, be legally held to account for starting aggressive wars, like in Iraq? Is it fair and moral that Bush-era officials be given immunity from prosecution? If they're not held accountable, then who is ultimately responsible? To crosstalk crimes and punishment, I'm joined by Indra Komar in San Francisco. He is the 